watch us each week, like us on Facebook, share our information with your family and your friends. And then again, you can go to Facebook at House of God VA, and you can share that information uh, with the people you love and care about so they can join us for our Sabbath school. We have a three question framework. What does it say? What's our observation? That's really important. What does it mean? How do we interpret that scripture as we look at it, the lens of what was going out on at the point in time that the writer was writing? And then to me, most importantly, how do we apply that to our life? Uh, and we'll look at that today as we dig into this lesson around Noah found grace. And so one of the things I want to do, if you've got your Sabbath school book with you, this is lesson number 48, um, Noah found grace. Today's date is August 13th. And we're going to walk through this lesson. Introduction. Digger Preston. Yes, sir. We just started the couple of the saints. It's fine now. Okay, go ahead. We're good. Okay. God has given grace unto man from the beginning. The first mention of grace in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6, when Noah found grace. The Hebrew word for grace comes from the root that means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior or to favor. Strong's Dictionary. The omniscient and omnipotent God has granted his kindness and favor to us, even though we don't deserve it. The grace that God extends to man is often unrecognized or underappreciated. Memory verse, Genesis chapter 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the days of Noah, God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In this present day, the wickedness of man in the earth is astounding. From sexual sin to hatred, murders, thefts, and deceptions, sin is prevalent today. Before coming to Christ, each of us committed sins they made us deserve death. The wages of sin are death, but God still had mercy on us and extended grace to each of us. God knows everything about us, including what we are going to do before we do it. Psalms 139, 1 through 4. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compass me, my path, and my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my mouth, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Our salvation is not something we can earn or deserve. As we strive to keep God's law, statutes, and judgments, we realize that salvation is and always, always has been by grace through faith. So as we think about this lesson, uh, Noah found grace. We're going to have some conversation around that piece. But as an apostle, before we jump into it, anything you want to add as we read through the Sabbath school lesson around Noah finding grace? You know, I thank God. Uh, I want to thank the writer, uh, uh, Brother Hirsch, for the Sabbath school lesson. I think he's done a very good job um, of organizing this, and I think it's going to be beneficial for us today. All right. So I want to just jump into some things I want to share as we think through this lesson today. Um, when we think about grace and mercy, and so Apostle, we'll have some conversation. We'll open it up to the class if the class has a different thought about it. So I wanted to just anchor here around grace and mercy. So when we think about God's mercy, God's mercy is not giving sinners. And remember, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God's mercy is not giving sinners what they do deserve. We deserve the punishment because we're guilty of sin. So the mercy is the act of withholding the punishment we deserve. God's grace is positively giving sinners what they do not deserve, the act of showing favor. So there's a difference between grace and mercy from my perspective, but Apostle, before we jump into this lesson, that was one of the questions I even had for myself. What, what's really the difference between grace and mercy? So I wanted to start there and get your thoughts, and I'll open it up to the class right off the bat around your thoughts on grace 
and mercy. Apostle, go right ahead. You know, I think I'm pressing. That's one of the things that I have given a lot of thought to over the years. And I, this is where I have rested. Um, we all receive the mercies of God. Everybody received the mercies of God. But I believe that the grace of God is intended for the righteous. Mm. And that's, you know, I've, I've looked at it, you know, several different, because you're right. Uh, when people have used the term grace and mercy interchangeable, but when I, when I look more in the scriptures, uh, who received grace, grace was extended to the righteous, to, to those that God favor, those that, and I think that was part of your definition, wasn't it? So the, the, the favor of God is, uh, that's when he extends grace. Uh, to those that, uh, to me, that he have chosen to be a part of his body. Now, the results of grace and the results of mercy may seem to be the same. Mm, but the okay. application of grace and mercy, to me, is different when it comes to sinners and saints. All right, we're three minutes in, and Charmaine's already ready with a question. <laughs> so, Charmaine, go right ahead. No, no, only because the question ties into his comments. Okay, so, go ahead. Without jumping too fast ahead of you, Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 19, deals with how sin, because of the fall of, of Adam, sin was upon everyone. So now Jesus came, so grace is available. So along those lines, when you say grace is for the righteous only, how does that apply, or am I taking that scripture out of context? May not. I'm just, but see, Jesus came for what? Jesus came to save sinners. Jesus right. came that that our relationship would be different. We got a hand in the audience, too. Um, after Charmaine and, so Charmaine and I have this, uh, Brother John has something he wants to say. But let me just say, what I'm looking at is that Jesus came, you know, uh, to extend another level to those that ha that will follow him. See, the, the mercies that the sinners get, a lot, of the, a lot of them never come to Christ. They don't, mm. they don't live a godly life. You know, they go down the road and, uh, and they um, they're driving, going a curve, and as soon as they go on the curve, a tree fall behind them. Thank God for his mercy. Mm. Right? Um, and But I'm looking at the same incident may have happened to one of the saints. And I'm going to say that's God's grace. Okay. Because grace came by Jesus Christ. All right. It looks like we're going, we're going to deal with this question today as we go through that. Because I, I think that's important, Apostle. And again, I think your, your view on that, I, I remember you shared that uh, some time ago. And I don't know if I necessarily see it that way, but that's the reason we have these conversations yeah, yeah. around grace and mercy. I know we've got a hand from Brother John. I want to hear his thoughts. And then we're going to jump right into um, Genesis chapter six. I want to make sure that we get to Romans because Sister Charmaine, I think you bring up a good point. So Brother John, go right ahead. Uh, a lot of times I think there's a misunderstanding about grace. And a while back I found out description of God's grace in Titus verse 11 and 12 for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men so there's different kinds of grace but God's grace that brings salvation it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world I think when Noah found grace, this is what he was operating in. And then God extended his mercy to him. And see, Brother John, that's what I'm saying. The grace of God brings salvation. If the sinner have no intent for salvation, then the grace of God is really not for him. Okay. I just want um, to and, and so... Is, is Brother John, I want to hear Brother John. So Brother John is using, he's, he's looking at that scripture in Titus, and we may circle back to that. But Apostle, can you repeat what you just said? So you, you're saying that the grace of God, so, so God extends his grace to people who are going to follow him? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's All right. To bring, because that was the purpose of Jesus coming, right? Okay. 
That was the purpose of Jesus coming. Now, think about this. The argument could be, well, Noah was before Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he was. But God's intent for the grace he showed to, to Noah was to, 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 to destroy this world as we know it, as it was then, and, and let mankind, let humanity start over again with the mindset of grace. And we know what happened. That still didn't work. And then um, then Jesus, then God sent Jesus um, to bring another level to people of extending grace. And that's when people start right. receiving Christ. And when he went back to glory, they received the spirit. Okay. So what we're going to do, I want I wanted to still tackle that. And I, I agree with Sister Myra. So Titus chapter 2, verse 11 is a great scripture. That is a phenomenal scripture to utilize. If you don't have that in, in your memory deck, make sure you put that one in there. So that was Titus chapter 2, verse 11. And so what I want us to do, if you've got questions, put them in the um, chat, put them or come off mute or put them, if you're watching us on Facebook, um, bring your questions up because this is really a good topic that we want to make sure we discuss. Go ahead, Apostle. I think the thing is, in the latter part of that, uh, that 11th verse, uh, bring of salvation that has appeared to all men. Mm -hmm. See, salvation is offered to all men. The grace that is associated with salvation is offered to everybody. Not everybody's going to receive it. Okay. All right. Um, and so I think that will be a good place for us to just think about, even as we embark on this story around Noah, uh, it's going to be helpful for us as we dig into it. So, hey, before we jump into Noah, many of us remember, and, and for me, I think about uh, whether it was Sunday school classes, doing arts and crafts around learning about Noah. So if you don't mind, come off mute, put it in the chat. Um, what do you know about Noah? Who was this man we know as Noah. So talk to me, Sabbath School, who was Noah as we dig into learning about this man of God? What do you know about him? New Testament said he was a preacher of righteousness. All right, he was a preacher of righteousness? Okay. Thank had, you, Elder. Go he ahead. Had, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He had three sons. What else? What else do we know about Noah? He was very handy. <laughs> he was very handy. Quite I'll a good builder. Huh? <laughs> he was the art builder. What else do we know? What else do we know about him? He was a drinker. <laughs> now, we Russell. caught him one time drinking. <laughs> Russell, come on. <laughs> and uh, so we know him from that. Um, and so as we look at the scriptures, so I appreciate that. Um, someone said, uh, Deacon Fain shared with us that Noah translates to mean rest. Um, the other thing I would have you think about, if you look at Genesis chapter 9, I think it's verse 28, uh, Noah lived 950 years. Noah lived 950 years. Uh uh, Sister Nicholson, thank he was determined. Um, the other thing is, I was studying this, a lot of times we don't look at it, but actually Noah is, when we think about Adam as the father of mankind, Noah would actually be the second father of mankind, because when we think about the flood, everything is wiped out except Noah and those who got on the ark with him. That's why and he so, lived so long. <laughs> that's probably why he lived so long. And so, Think about that. The other thing is we look into the scripture. I want us to think about, we're going to read this scripture, how Noah found grace. Um, and, and that's important because the word find, when you look at it, it is an active word that he was actually searching for it in a time where people were wicked. So I want you to go, I want us to think about this time period. We go from Adam, then we think about Adam's sin. And we'll talk about that in Romans if we get there. And we talk about Cain and Abel. We see some things that happen around Cain and Abel. And then we encounter, you know, Seth is born. That's another child that's born. And then we run into uh, a man named Lamech. 
If you go back to Genesis chapter five, at the end of Genesis chapter five, you will run into Lamech. And Lamech is a man of violence when you really study the scripture. And he's actually Noah's father. And so we learn some things about this great man, Noah, as we learn about him, his handiwork. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to think about that, and Michael Hamner says that God told him to build an ark. And when you study the scripture, God told him to build an ark and it had never rained before. They had never seen rain, but God said, build an ark. And when I study the scripture, I don't see where Noah even questioned it. He just heard God's voice and he obeyed God. So with that, let's jump into Genesis chapter six. And we're going to begin at verse one. So if you've got your Bibles, let's dig in together. Genesis chapter six, beginning at verse one. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now I want to stop right there because a lot of times when you look at this and there are several views on this statement around the sons of God and the da and the daughters of men. And so this daughters of men is actually, um, they would be human women. And some people who study this and say the sons of God would have said these were fallen angels or Nephilim, or they would, they would call them, they were not men on the earth. Um, they would have been men who were, um, some say they would have been angelic beings who um, took the appearance of men. So that's one thing that people say. I want to I want to just put that out there. The other, some people say they were falling angels. Um, others say they were descendants of Seth. And so there are two or three different views on that. Um, if you were studying it, you would have you would have looked at that. I'll stop right there, Apostle. I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that, but people read that and they have different views. So go right ahead on your thoughts. You know, I think that. And I understand all the views, and, and all the views make sense. But to me, it's just one way of expressing men and women. Yep. You know what I'm saying? That, that's right. Exactly. That's you know, just one way of expressing men and, and women. You know, they, here it's saying the sons of God, men, saw the uh, daughters of men. Just, you know, they're females. But all I'm saying is that I don't think it was anything an angelic about it. I just think it's a way of expressing men and women. <laughs> yeah, I love that, Apostle. And, and again, that is one of the views as well. Um, and I, I'm glad you brought that out. So let's jump to verse three and listen to this. And it said, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and 20 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And here's verse eight, but Noah, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So I'm going to stop right there. And Apostle, as I dig into the scripture, and I'll open it up to questions as we think through it. We see this wickedness in the earth, this time period from Adam's sin, again, Cain and Abel. We see some things with Noah's father, Lamech, and others. This wickedness is so prevalent that as you look at the word repent, it actually, God was actually sorrowful that he had created man and man had everything that man imagined was evil. Everything that he thought about doing was evil. 
And again, when God looked at this, God's intent for man was it was a beautiful garden. It was peace. It was love. But when man given to sin, it just becomes destructive. So, Apostle, any thoughts before we keep digging into this scripture? And then I'll get something that Brother uh, Fain mentions on Facebook. Go ahead, Apostle. You know, when I look at verses six and seven, all I see is God getting ready to reverse creation. Mm. He's saying not only man, but he's talking about the creeping things, the fowl of the air, everything that he made in creation, he's ready to destroy it. Right. He's he ready to look at creation and said, yes, I made man, and, and man has not turned out the way I wanted him to. Man is wicked. And we yeah. can see that today. I'm not saying we're going to see it in our lifetime, but we see the decisions being made, and we see man's approach just to life and, and what he what he embraces and, and what he permits, he's getting back to that state where, you know, where, and that's what it's going to take before God makes his return. God is going to, and he knows the day he's going to do it. It's not going to be a surprise to him, but that's what's, what we see um, taking place now that is, that is creeping, that is coming up to the day that God is going to destroy the earth. It's the same thing that God saw in the days of Noah when he saw how how wicked man became. And guess what? Man is becoming wick, more wicked every day. Right. So, I, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking at, you know. And, it, and if we find grace in the, in the eyes of God as Noah did, mm -hmm. then what's going to happen? The grace that we find in the eyes of God is not going to stop him from destroy, destroying the earth, but it will cause us to be right. saved. And, and and to have life everlasting. An apostle, that's what we want to get to. So I, I want to touch on that. You mentioned something. God said, I'm going to destroy everything I created. Yes. But let's think about in creation. Everything God created, he said it was good. Yes. Everything he created was good. And he said that after he created those things. And now because of sin, and we've got to think about this, you hear me say it all the time. Sin doesn't leap on you. It creeps on you. Right. And what happens is after this period of time, sin has caused man to just have a degenerative mind. All he thinks about is wickedness. Um, our deacon Fain says, Noah represents the righteous minority. Those who enter the narrow gate in the midst of a wicked world, those who follow the broad way leading to destruction. So I love that, Deacon Fane, that you share that perspective. Again, Noah, in verse 8, we see he found grace. And we're going to spend some time on that because I don't want us to overlook that. Go ahead, Apostle, and then I'm going to get Brother yeah. uh, Victor. I just want to say this. Um, Noah found grace. The scripture never says that his sons and his daughters found grace. <laughs> See, That's right. they were saved because of Noah, being in Noah's household. That's why after the flood, sin continued. Mm. Mm. That's good. That's good. All right, Brother Victor, Sister Monica, I see your hand up. Go right ahead. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad to be in the group this morning. <laughs> we're glad um, you're here. Thank you so much. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the remark was made that God destroyed everything he created. But if we, if we just think back, God had Noah to save two of everything that he created. It was his and, desire to and, destroy. And, 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 he, and so did he with the humans. He, he saved Noah and his eight family members. So it was a matter of, of us starting anew because he didn't recreate anything. He just had him to bring two male and female into the, into the ark. So he could start over again, brand new, and hopefully he would do a little better this time. But he he didn't destroy everything. He didn't have to recreate, because, yes. Because he, that's right, right. That's right. That's exactly right. All right. So let's look at this right here in verse eight, and then we're gonna. I want to go to eight, nine, and we're gonna spend some time. So, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so think about this. 
Noah found grace. He was actively looking for grace. As I study, when you think about this, he was a man of integrity, and Deacon Fain touched on it. In a world that had become wicked, he was the, the light uh, that was showing. He was the one that was, and again, watch what it says. Noah walked with God. And that's important for us to understand. All right, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the, corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through men. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms that were made in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with the lower second, and the third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and, the, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee, there shall be male and female, of the fowls after their kind and the cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing on the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for them and for, for thee and for them. Verse 22, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So, Apostle, I want to ask this question. As we look at this, and Deacon Fain touched on it, when I look at Noah's example that he found grace, that he walked with God, and so uh, my question to you would be, if I'm walking up right before God, can I actually be the thing that saved my own family? Oh, yes. Now, each family member have a, <clears throat> have a soul. And yes. that member has to repent to God. And that individual have a soul must be saved by God by, by their doing. But I believe that the mercies of God is extended to family members because of where you are. Because he said it in his word. To a thousand, you know, the third and fourth generation. So he had that promise made to mankind about saving his families or extending uh, grace to his families. So the grace can be extended. So here's the thing I would encourage all of us to think about: our lifestyle can be can be a blessing to our family members. Our walking up right before God us doing the things of God, being obedient to God's word. Uh, that's why I always say, if we're consistent in our walk with God, somebody's seeing that. And so the thing is, as I think about Noah, in the time where it would have been easy for him to be wicked, and I want us to think about this, in the time in our country and our world, when it is easy to follow the majority, the question becomes, will you follow men or will you follow God? Um, what shall we then say? If God be for us, who can be against us? So I want to stop right there. I know, Sister Charmaine, you may have had some questions, um, and, and we'll jump. We're hopefully going to get to Romans uh, today. I want to open it up. Any comments, questions, or thoughts before we jump to our next scripture around grace? All right, Deacon Raglan, question. If Noah had not had not have operated in faith, would he have found grace and been saved from the flood even without the ark? What is the importance of faith and obedience and finding grace 
with God? Great question. So let's just think about the question. If Noah had not have operated in faith, would he have found grace and been saved from the flood even without the ark? What is the importance of faith and obedience in finding grace with God? So I'll start, Apostle, and I'll let you clean me up if I miss anything. So let's go back to the scripture because I think Deacon Ragland brings up a good point. So let's just think about what this scripture says. Verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it talks about these are generations of Noah. But now look, Noah was a just man and perfect. So I take that Noah was living the life. And then it says Noah was doing what? He was walking with God. And when he heard God's voice at the end of the chapter six, whatever the Lord commanded him to do, he was obedient. So I do think Deacon Ragland, from my perspective, because he walked with God, he knew the voice of God. When God told him to do something, he did it. And because God knew his integrity and his character, that's how he found grace. And so to me, he was operating in faith. And that is part of us finding the grace of God. That's my thought. Apostle, clean me up if I'm missing something. No, I think you missed missing thing. I think the thing we have to recognize is that Noah was who Noah was because of God. Mm. God, everything Noah did, God put it in him. God, you know, the, the scripture doesn't go into his childhood and this, that, and the other. But whatever Noah did, uh, Noah did it because of God helped create the relationship. Because God had already ordained that it was going to be somebody mm. that he was going to use to preserve mankind, to preserve uh, what he had what he had made in creation um, to us to a lesser degree, just keeping two alive to to replenish the earth. But God created that, <laughs> and yes, Noah had to be a man of faith because the scripture tells us, and he what well, without faith mm. is impossible to please God. And Noah was uh, was was righteous. Noah was perfect. In order for Noah to have been righteous and perfect in his generation, Noah had to have faith to please God. So I, I think, the, you know, Revelation, um, and, 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 um, when it's 13, 6, when it says, without faith, it's 11 and 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Answer the question, yes, Noah had to have faith. Yeah, and I think the other thing, to, to Deacon Ragland's point, I don't. I think God would have saved him even without the ark. I don't know the means in which God would have saved him and delivered him from that situation, but because he had found grace, he operated in faith and obeyed the voice of God, God would have found a way to make sure Noah was delivered in that situation. So, uh, Deacon, I, I think hopefully, and I, I see your comment, that, that's the thing to me. So here, here's the, my takeaway from that question. Um, even in the midst of the world we live in, if we follow and obey God and do the thing God, God commands us to do, um, God will deliver us from it. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. But we know when we obey and do the things that God uh, is calling us to do, that God will take care of his people. Now, let me say this. Sometimes him taking care of us actually may be we will lose our life. And that part of it, because again, from God's perspective, this life is minimal. He's looking at making sure we have eternal life. I heard somebody, somebody shared with me something this week. Um, sometimes God doesn't deliver you from it. He will develop you in it. And so we just got to understand that's how God operates. So I see some comments, some questions. I'm going to get Sister Charmaine. I see some uh, Sister Zeld and some other comments I want to get. Sister Charmaine, go right ahead. So how does grace work? Wow. Okay. How does grace work? And that's a question I'll probably get to as we look at Ephesians chapter 2. Um, but again, I, if you're okay with me tabling that question, I want to get to that. How does grace work. Apostle, do you have anything you want to share? Because I'll try and jump to Ephesians chapter 2 now. I'm going to say this. If Noah did not have the relationship that he had with God, 
after building the ark, after doing those three stories and doing everything that he did, the most important thing he would have missed, and that was the pitch. <laughs> Why I said that, he would have built all of that beautiful mm. structure, loaded with animals, and when the rain came, it mm. would have allowed water to come in, and, and, and that, that ark would not have survived. Something as simple as pitching, you know, pitching was like a slime they put inside and out. You know, what what they call it, they, that um that tape, that flex. Flex seal. Flex seal, yeah. He, 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 that was the first flex seal. Uh, so he, he did that and it did not leak. Uh, I, I, love, I love that. I got some comments. I want to make sure we get to Sister Charmaine's question and we're going to jump to Ephesians chapter two to look at that. Um, how how does grace work? But I want to capture some of these comments that we got on here. And I appreciate y'all's engagement. Sister Zelda said this, mercy is that he did not kill me and send me to hell in my mess. Grace is allowing me to live and learn of him to receive his spirit awaiting eternal life. Sister Zelda, I love that. Uh, I love that. I'm going to have to write that in my journal. Rashad, Brother Rashad says this, our lifestyle can also be a curse to our family. That's, true. That's a great point. Our lifestyle can be a, a curse to our family. And then Deacon Fain says this, part of our salvation is connected to our obedience. James chapter 2, 17, faith without works is dead. Noah had to obey the practical instructions to build the ark. Amen. Great comments, great engagement. It helps all of us with a better understanding of grace, faith, obedience. So appreciate the comments. I see Russell West has a comment. And as we do that, let's get ready to jump into Ephesians uh, chapter two. Uh, Brother West. Uh, Deacon, uh, Elder, I mean, uh, John three, the, the, the conversation God had with uh, Nicodemus is, 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 I think is the simplest uh explanation of grace Talk uh, to me. tell me how he, he let them know that uh whoever is born of god we got to be born of the water of the spirit and then the 18th verse said uh he that believeth on him not is condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten of the son of god and the same way uh apostle was talking about jesus the grace is to those, to the righteous, unto salvation. That's the grace of God. Everybody want to uh, want to claim the grace of God, but like Apostle said, grace is extended to those God wants to be saved. Ooh. <laughs> All right, so uh, you're you're following in Apostle Raglan's camp that grace <laughs> is just for the believer. You know I believe it. All right, so we're going to have to touch on that because I don't know if I necessarily agree with that comment. <laughs> but again, uh, Apostle and I, we may tug a war on this one a little bit, but we'll just find out what the scripture says. And I thank God for that perspective. Uh, that may be one of the things that we end Sabbath school with is how, how are you seeing that one right there? So, but let's jump into Ephesians chapter two, because I want to get to Sister Charmaine's question. And I want you to think about it as a Sabbath school class. How does grace work? So that's the question. How does it work? So when we think about the grace of God, and now as we look at Ephesians chapter two, I want us to think about this question how does grace work? Well, before we do that, what I want to do, I want to just give you a quick overview when we think about the book of Ephesians, because I want to give you a context of what Paul was writing as he was writing this letter. Um, so when you look at it, Paul wrote the letter of Ephesians sometimes be between 80, 60, and 61, around the same time he had written Colossians and Philemon. And as he sent all three letters by the hand of Titius, accompanied by Onesimus, it was during this time that Paul sat in Rome undergoing his first imprisonment, making Ephesians one of the four epistles commonly known as the prison epistles 
The other ones are Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul divided his letter to the Ephesians into two clear segments. Applying the truths of the first makes possible the actions and lifestyle of the second. So Paul spends the first three chapters of the letter discussing God's creation of a holy community by his gift. And think about that. His gift of grace in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The members of this community have been chosen by God through the work of Christ, adopted as sons and daughters of God, and brought near to the Father through faith in his Son. All people with this faith, Jews and Gentiles alike, were dead in their transgression and sins, but have been made alive because of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So the thing I would have you take away from this, it says his gift of grace in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about that as we dig into this scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. And here's what it says. And you have he quickened or made alive who were dead and trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now think about this. Paul is saying that he is quick and he made us alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. He said, in times past, you walk according to this world. It's like Paul is sitting at our kitchen table telling us, guess what, Walter? You were there at one point in time. You walked. You were a child of disobedience. Your conversation was not good. You had lust in the flesh. You had this thing with your mind. You were a child of wrath, even as others. But look at verse four. He says, but God who is rich in mercy. Now there's that word again, mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin. Man, you should be giving God glory right there. Even when we were dead in sin, he has quickened, again, made us alive together with Christ. Now watch this. He says, by grace, ye are saved. Now let's think about that. He said, when, when we think about this scripture, verse four said, but God who is rich in mercy, remember what we said, mercy is really about God not giving me what I deserve. Grace is about God giving a sinner what I don't deserve. So mercy is, uh, he, I do deserve the punishment. I do deserve, I, I, I did commit the sin. I am guilty. And God says, you know what? You deserve it, but I'm going to show you mercy. Grace is positively giving me, the sinner, something I don't deserve, a gift. And let's watch what it says. It says, by grace, ye are saved and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. For God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off or made nigh, by the blood of Christ. If you don't have Ephesians 2, 1, 13, 1 through 13 marked in your Bible, I encourage you to do that. So now, Apostle, let's dig into this question as we look at it around grace. What is grace 
And why is this grace so important as we dig into the scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13? So I want to just jump to that apostle, to Sister Charmaine's question, as she asked, what is grace? And as I think about this gift of grace that God gives us, and I don't deserve it. So if you were talking to just answering the question for Charmaine or someone who was not somebody who is unchurched, how would we explain grace? And this just isn't for Apostle Raglan. I want the Sabbath school. Tell me to someone who is unchurched, how would you explain grace? You Apostle, know, I'm going to start with you, and then we're going to go from there. You know, Dick Preston, the unchurch will find themselves in Ephesians um, 2 and 2, verses 2 and 3. That's what we are talking about, where in times past, you walk, what, you the unchurch. You were like the unchurch. You walk in the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air. Um, and then verse, and I'm, and children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, right? Right. And the lust of the flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh of our mind. And we were by nature the children of wrath. The, the, the unchurch by nature is the children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherein he loved us. When you were unchurch, God showed mercy to you because he loved us. When you were doing whatever you wanted to do, living the life you wanted to live, but then you came to Christ. Then by the grace of God, you were brought to Christ. And that's how I see the difference between mercy and grace. You were brought to Christ for, and that's what I go back to my the statement about grace being for righteous purposes. You know, um, yes, why they were clean, why they were being cleaned up, why they were being changed, um, God's mercy was still there, but grace was bringing them out of that state they were in in times past, and now setting them in a place where God, where, where they're serving God. All right, so would you say, and again, I, I'm asking the question because I want to make sure I get a good understanding and the class gets a good understanding. Would you say that grace is that thing um, that, that is drawing us? Is, is, it, is it the thing that draws us? Because he said it is a gift of God. And he said, um, but is by grace, you are saved. You didn't right. do it. You, you couldn't earn it. You couldn't work for it. It's not in how many commandments I keep. It's not in me dotting the I and crossing the T. It's God saying, Walter, you don't deserve it, but because I love you, I'm going to extend my grace. All right, yes. I want to stop yeah, now, right now. Yeah, yeah, Sister, yeah, Sister Thurston, you always want to have something to say, but let me just say this, Dingham Preston. Yep. Um, I agree exactly with that, but to the unchurch. But to those who are living a, a, a ungodly life, he still shows mercy. All right, all right. So you're still going. You're still going with. There's a difference between grace and mercy. All right, I love that apostle. I mean, the application. Let me just say this: the results are pretty much the same, but the application between grace and mercy is different. That's what I see. Uh, I want to get Lady Thurston. I think Deacon Fain has a great point. I want to bring out, and then I'm going to get Brother West. And again, I appreciate your engagement. Lady Thurston, go right ahead. Praise the Lord. You know, I see grace as an unearned favor. Yes. And we know that grace was, you know, I've heard coming out of the first day, I've heard that we're no longer under the law, but we're under grace. But this lesson shows us, and the scripture tells us that grace has always been because Noah found grace in the sight of our God. So now as far as me looking at grace, when I was not in the church, when I was in the world, God showed me grace, you know, because he, he took care of me. It was unearned. And when he died on the cross and took away my sins, that too was grace. And that tells me that grace was open to everybody. As a <laughs> sinner, as a Christian or whatever, there's, God gave us all grace. You know, and even today, people in the world are receiving grace and mercy. But as Apostle said, when we come into the church, we still have grace. But the thing of it is, we don't know when grace and mercy is going to wear out. 
You know, we can't take it for granted. We have to appreciate it. But I feel like grace has always been whether you're in the church or out of the church. And see, my thing would be in Noah's situation, there was no one else during that time that the scripture said received grace. Okay. All right. So I, I want to get to Deacon Fane's point. Deacon Raglan brings up a good point that I think is a really good one that may help us, but I want to make sure we answer Sister Charmaine's question, what does grace look like? And then we've got Brother West, who's got a comment. So I, I, want, to, I want to get this point. Um, Deacon Fane says, the grace of God is his provision of favor to grant us the space and opportunity to obtain salvation. I want to read that again. The grace of God is his provision of favor to grant us the space and opportunity to obtain salvation. And then he says, I see what you're saying, Apostle Raglan. Noah's family wasn't seeking grace like Noah. They only survived off the mercy of God through the grace shown to Noah. All right, so we might have we might have something right there that I may need to study a little bit more that I like that. So so go ahead, uh, uh, Russell West, and then Deacon Ragland brings up a point that I think, and I'm gonna ask Deacon Ragland to come off mute. He might be siding with Apostle Ragland on this thing on grace and mercy. Go ahead, Brother West. Uh, look at look look at uh, Acts. Look at uh, Peter's in, in, in second, in Acts the second chapter, look at uh, Peter's, uh, his preaching, and then look at Stephen's preaching. Okay. Grace is simply the fact that when Peter, because they preached the same message, Peter, when he finished, they asked, what must I do to be saved? That's right. When Stephen finished, they, they bit upon him. Grace is what makes the word of God prick your heart, prick your heart. Mm. Mercy is the fact that they bid on him and like like just like when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus and Stephen prayed for them. That's mercy. But the ones who heart is pricked receive grace. Okay? It's the same word, God. It's the same power being extended to everybody. A uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe on him will have everlasting life. Whosoever <laughs> receives grace, everybody else are not, God's not going to prick their heart to receive the grace of God. Okay. All right. Unto salvation. Like the like apostle said. Unto salvation. Okay. All right. So, uh, Brother Wes, I love that point. I see Deacon Faye. I love the point that y'all have made. Uh, I think so. So we're going to work through this. And I want to close the loop on Sister Charmaine's question because I want to make sure we answer that. And I appreciate the conversation we're having around this topic. Hopefully, as you walk away from, from this lesson, all of us can recognize it. God gives us the gift of grace. And without grace, we would not be saved. It is by the grace of God. That's why Ephesians chapter two is so important. He talks to people that were in sin. They were living a ragged life. They were, they were in the children of disobedience. They were children of wrath. But then Paul shuts it off and he said, but God, and he talks about the mercy, but he said, it is by grace that we are saved, not by works and works are important, but works doesn't give me salvation. And that salvation is the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. The thing is, God gives us the opportunity by his grace for us to be saved. So I, and I see Apostle looking, and I see him. I see that look, but I want to get Deacon Ragland's question. And Deacon, I'm going to ask you to come off mute because I believe uh, your question is a good one. And here's the question. Do I have to believe in order to accept the grace of God? It is by faith that grace comes. If the unchurched doesn't believe, 
where then does grace appear or come in? So Deacon Ragland, if you're out there, come off mute and explain that thought to us. Yeah, and I'll say at the onset, so thank you, Deacon. <laughs> so Deacon Preston, yes, I'll say on the onset, I agree with Apostle, right? I, okay. tonight, I will go to Brother Wes, uh, certainly um, John um, 316 says that we must believe, right? Mm -hmm. We go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse six, he that comes unto me must first what? Believe. Believe, right? Um, I, I, I think about Abraham. Abraham, uh, it was accounted to him for righteousness because what? He believed God. So I don't think you can have grace, which is Jesus Christ. You can't have grace unless you believe. Ooh. And Ooh. for the sinner... For the unchurched, without the faith in God, without the faith in the resurrection of Jesus, there is no grace. You are living under mercy. Okay. All right. You know, I think it goes I, back. Apostle, I, I, I want to get I want to get that. And I, I apologize for cutting you off. No, 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 I want to I, I want Deacon Ragland then with that thought process, Sister Charmaine's question, because I want to close the loop. What does grace look like? How did do, what does it look like? How did, how did it work? And that's what I was going to say. Um, with, with all that we have heard, uh -huh. Sister Charmaine's question go back to this. What does grace look like? Grace look like an, an individual that has been drawn to Christ, that has accepted drawing, and yet they do fall short from time to time. But because they have the grace of God, he picks them up and mm. and. and, and and they are in, a, enable them to continue their journey towards everlasting life. Okay. That's, like that's that. what grace does. The person that is the sinner still have the mercies of God. When they mess up, you know, God doesn't strike them dead. Um, mm -hmm. They're worthy of death. And even with the, with the saint, with the person who has accepted Christ, when they mess up, it is still worthy of death. Right. It is. You know, don't say it, what the sinner does is worthy of death, but when the saint does it, it's not worthy of death. No, they're both worthy of death, but God's extend mercy to one because that one is not trying to, to live a righteous life, not trying to follow Christ. I, I, Sister Thurston, I have her hand up, um, Deacon Preston. But the one that is, um, that is righteous, when they err, it's the grace of God. That he extends to them to bring them back in line. And from the very uh, first statement you made, Dick and Preston, was people use the term grace and mercy interchangeable. And that's why. Because the end result of it for the individual looks the same. But that's the right. end result that's of right. it for Christ, one, he's, I'm extending mercy to you, but the other one, I'm extending grace because I know your desire is to have everlasting life. Yeah, Apostle, now I know we're going to get Lady first, and I think that's a good point. As, as I was studying this and looking at the differences, you're right. The end result is really the same thing. And I think for us to understand that, and, and someone said, uh, Minister Elder Rashawn said, this is how you amicably disagree with each other. And that's true, <laughs> is that we just, we, right, we just, we may just have a different view on it, but, but, the, but the thing is, I like what you said. Um, when we think about mercy and grace, the end result really looks the same. And what I don't want us to, to walk away with is the conversation around agreeing to disagree. No. What I want us to walk away with is thank God for his grace. Yes. Because without his grace, none of us on this call today would have been saved. So, Lady Thurston, we're going to get to one more scripture but I want to make sure after Lady Thurston, I want to get it back to Charmaine to make sure we answered the question. So go right ahead, Lady Thurston. So I have a question. Uh, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, was that grace or mercy or both? It was grace for the believer. He still extends mercy to the unbeliever. Mm. So as a sinner, they are not under grace. They're under mercy. So, okay, I'm looking at Ephesians. They just read, for yeah. grace is a gift of God. Yes. 
So you're saying, in other words. And so is mercy, though. Mercy is a gift of God. So grace is unearned favor. I don't care what you do. Right. You could God Both have. Them, that's yeah. right. So that's you're right. saying with mercy, uh, get, grace was given to the believer. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And mercy was extended to anyone. Whosoever. Anyone. anyone. I like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you know, they're so, it's just, they're so close. The two, yeah. the two are so close that, you know, sometimes even though I know I feel confident that grace is for the believer. You may hear me say mercy. Yeah. I may, and let's be real, I may use the two terms interchangeable, but for my my understanding of what the application of the two is, that's where I see grace is being extended to the believer. Yeah. Let me say this right quick, and then I'm going to get to Sister Charmaine. Uh, Apostle, I want to personally thank you for your wisdom, because as I've been sitting here making notes myself, not that I am going to a different camp, because I need to, <laughs> but, but I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate God's wisdom to be able to explain that. And, and hopefully if you're watching us on Facebook or listening on Zoom, the wisdom of the man of God, it, it's, it's great to have that from the standpoint of, I've been sitting here as the teacher making notes on, on seeking some additional clarity. So I want to say that as the teacher, I'm learning in this lesson today, and I thank God for our Apostle Raglan and those, all those that are contributing to the class. Now, more importantly, <laughs> did we answer Sister Charmaine's question? Because we've had a lot of good conversation. Sister Charmaine, if you could come off mute, um, I want you to just, if we didn't a answer your question, continue. Let's explore that as we wrap up this lesson. I guess my my best response is to try to, um, this is what I heard. I heard that grace is where salvation resides. And that it is my, it is the tool for me as a righteous saint where I no longer am bound to sin. When I fall, I have grace. Yes. Mm. If, I, if I abide in mercy, now even though the scripture says his mercy is renewed every morning, I'm still out of the arc of safety because I don't have salvation. I get that through the grace of God. Mm. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, and Charmaine, you gave a great nugget. And, and, and again, grace is where salvation resides. That to me, as we wrap up this lesson, that's a powerful nugget that uh, I'm going to take away and make note of grace is where salvation resides. So, hey, I know we are close to time. I've got some other comments. Hopefully, Sabbath School, you've enjoyed the, just as we looked at some of the scriptures, as we've had this conversation, hopefully you recognize we are all learning in our Sabbath School. That's why we encourage you to come to Sabbath School. I thank you so much for your contributions in class today, because again, I'm making my notes and, and, and trying to get a better understanding. I want to go to Deacon Fain says, mercy is God's pity and compassion towards man with the understanding that man is inherently sinful. Renee Dixon said this, I always use my children as an example to help me understand grace. Even though my children may deserve punishment when they act crazy, I still do good things for them. <laughs> Amen. We thank you for that. Uh, Tristan Mincy says, praise the Lord, shalom, grace and blessings be unto you, Apostle and Lady Ragland. Um, she just wanted to say a blessing to us. Uh, Deacon Fain says, mercy is a risky place to be because it's not guaranteed. That's good wisdom, Deacon yes, Fain. Yes, yes. Uh, mercy is a risky place to be because it's not, because it's not guaranteed. Love that point. I know we're almost at time, Apostle, we're trying to get one more scripture in, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, but before we do that, Apostle, anything you want to share before we take a quick look at Romans? We want to go to Romans chapter 5, and I don't even know if I need to jump into that one. We may have to table this one and uh, go to, to we'll, we, maybe we'll just go to Titus chapter 2, and we'll finish where Brother John started us out today around grace. And I do want to read that scripture in Titus chapter two. Apostle, anything you want to share before we look at this last scripture? No, sir. You can go right there. 
<laughs> All right, so uh, Apostle is definitely earning his keep today with his the wisdom that he shared. So I appreciate that, Apostle. Let's go to Titus chapter two, and we kind of started uh, here. Deacon uh, or Brother John brought this point up, and this isn't in our Sabbath school lesson. We got a scripture from Titus in the Sabbath school lesson, but I just want to read as Paul was writing this letter, um, this letter around Titus, it's chapter two, verse 11. So let's listen to this. For the grace of God that bringeth what? Salvation. Salvation. And then Charmaine said this, grace is where salvation resides. So now we're connecting some of the dots. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the best hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I want to take away some, I want us to take away something uh, from this lesson. If you look at Ephesians chapter two, if you look at Titus chapter two, and even in the chapter three, um, the grace that God extends to us, uh, we have to make sure we operate in good works. We are his workmanship, and he expects us to do good work. So, um, Brother Victor, Sister Monica, they put a comment in. I like the de definition in the Sabbath school lesson. The Hebrew word for grace comes from the root word that means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior. And that is actually in the Sabbath school lesson today. So I know we had a lot of great conversation today. Um, as we wrap up this lesson, um, God has been good to us. He is really instructing us. Thank you for your engagement today. Apostle, I know you've got something to say, so I'm going to turn it over to you, and then we'll put it into the hands of our Sabbath school superintendent to wrap up this wonderful lesson today. God bless you, Apostle. Amen. Again, great lesson, Dagan. But I just want to, you know, you read Titus 2 and 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation <clears throat> has appeared to all men, <clears throat> teaching us. And then it goes on mm. to say, mercy <clears throat> does not teach us. Wow. We just hmm. thank God for mercy. <laughs> I escaped that one. But through grace, it teaches us yeah, that we need wow. to deny ungodly and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Yeah? And we're looking, because of grace, we're looking for the blessed hope. With mercy, we're not looking for the blessed hope. We just thank God we're looking for tomorrow. And the glorious appearing. All this come from the teaching of grace. That's why I'm saying, that's why I make the distinction the way I do between the two. See, the purpose of grace is to teach us to become godly, teach us to become righteous, teach us to become those individuals that God would have us to be. Amen. Apostle, I just, I put it out there. Uh, I thank God for your wisdom. Um, definitely appreciate your wisdom on this subject today. Um, I knew that you and I have a little different view on this. Uh, you did a masterful job of persuasion. So uh, maybe I've come a long way. <laughs> You'd be like, who was saying uh, that? I was almost persuaded. There was uh, King Agrippa. I was uh, almost with persuaded. Jesus, with giving um, crucified Jesus. Paul said, I was almost persuaded. <laughs> yeah, so here's the thing I would have us. Um, the scripture says, come, let us do what? Reason, Reason together. together. And, and that's the key. And so, again, Apostle, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for y'all's engagement in Sabbath school. And with that being said, we're going to put it into the hands of our Sabbath school superintendent, our sister Charmaine White. God bless you. Amen. We do thank the Lord for the lesson today. We praise God for the, the knowledge that he has given us. And we thank him for how he's blessing us. And we can't, and I don't want to take this for granted. So again, thank you so much for tuning in to the Sabbath School. And I trust that you have been blessed. And so we're going to close it out. 
and turn it into the hands of our Apostle James Regler. Amen. Thank you, Sister Charmaine. Uh, to all of those that have joined us by uh, Zoom and Facebook Live, I was trying to read the comments. And I don't have a device in front of me that um, I, I don't have my computer in front of me. So I, I thank Deacon Preston for sharing what's being stated, uh, what's being um, put in the chat on Facebook, I mean, on Zoom, because I don't see that. But I thank God for your engagement, your participation. And, you know, uh, I want to say this, with D Deacon Russell West, he lives in California. So he gets up three hours early. <laughs> Many uh, minute Sabbath just to join us. And, and Deacon West, we thank God for you and thank God for your engagement. And I don't I hate to start calling names, but I always um, enjoy what... Uh, Digger Fain has to uh, has to say it, and all of you that make comments. But I thank God for them because they, these brothers come from a great distance to be in, engaging in our Sabbath school. And I thank God for all of that. Again, thank God for Digger Preston, that teacher. Um, he's also an hour difference um, in the time zone he's in now. So we thank God for him continuing to share as a Sabbath school teacher, even though he's physically not here all the time. Now he's back and forth. Sometimes you see him at the background, it's the, the, the sanctuary here, uh, he's in the building. Sometimes you might see a different background, but we thank God for his engagement also. Just wanted to say to all of you, I thank God for the week that's coming to an end, and this week comes to an end with the opportunity for us to enjoy a day of rest. Amen. And, you know, we are, real, we are laid aside us. We laid aside things that we need to do. Yes, they're still there. Yes, they have to be taken care of. But God allows his people to have a 24-hour period that you don't even have to think about it. If you choose to think about it, that's on you. But he said, I've given you rest for this 24-hour period. Now, if you want Amen. to take your problems, if you want to bring your situation to the Sabbath, that's on you. But he said, I want you to rest. They want to come in with the sole purpose of giving God honor, giving him praise, worshiping the true and living God. That's what he wants from us today. And let's not cheat him out of that. Amen. We'll be back at, thank God for all of you again, we'll be back at um, uh, 1 o'clock for our afternoon worship. May the Lord watch between me and thee while we'll absent one from another. In Jesus' name, amen. And continue to pray for the Mitchie family. Um, um, Mother Mitchie, who's a pillar of that family, uh, been laid to rest today. And um, her. Yes, and keep Brother Lord, um, Charles Lord Christmas in prayer. He had surgery yesterday. He couldn't get his fever down. Um, so he had some, pro some um, joint replacements. They took those out. Well, they cleaned those and whatnot, and they found out that one was infected. So they're working on getting his fever down, but he needs your prayers. He really needs your prayers. So, all right. Be blessed, saints.